Howdy and thanks for joining me again, continuing in uh, our study of the book of Genesis and today I'm looking at Genesis chapter 6. First of all just a word about the structure of the first few chapters of Genesis. There is uh, a well-known rhetorical structure called a chiasm that is widely used in the Bible and in other ancient literatures in which the, the second half of a narrative tends to be a mirror image of the first half. Uh, and almost to repeat, but often uh, the opposite of. And the climax and focus of the narrative is not at the end, but in the middle. Now we can see something of this kind of structure in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, because it begins with one man, Adam, whose disobedience brings a curse upon the human race. There follows a genealogy during which mankind spreads through the world. And then there is the judgment of the flood and the redemption that comes through Noah, the rescue. That's followed by another genealogy during which mankind is scattered and ends in another man, Abraham, whose obedience brings about a blessing. So in these first 11 chapters of Genesis, the structure tends to position this next story of the flood and of Noah as the climax and the focus of the whole narrative, just as uh, the final judgment and the redemption through Jesus are the pinnacle and climax of history and of the scripture as a whole, so we find judgment and redemption, the pinnacle and climax of the story of our Genesis, our beginnings. And chapter 6 uh, begins with some slightly strange verses. Well, let me read them to you. It says, When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them whom they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days and also afterwards, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and how every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all of the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I have created. Now, there's two areas of difficulty in these verses, really. One is, <coughs> these phrases, the sons of God, the daughters of men, nobody really knows in the Hebrew what they actually mean. Nobody knows who the Nephilim were. In fact, this whole passage is difficult to understand, and you can't really find any authority who can say, well, this is what it means, uh, and find any sort of um, broad acceptance of that. Some have theorised that this is about somehow angels falling in love with human women and marrying and having children by them. That seems extremely fanciful, whichever way you look at it, and particularly given that Jesus actually said, angels in heaven do not marry and are not given in marriage. So it, it's... <coughs> It's one of those passages that we have to look at and say, well, in all fairness and honesty, let's not pretend or try and force something into this. We don't understand. One thing that science tells us is that in the past, two species of man coexisted on the earth together. Homo sapiens, modern man, and Homo neanderthalensis, neanderthal man. And that they interbred. And all of us have a certain amount of Neanderthal DNA in our genes. That's very interesting. Now, don't get me wrong. It would be completely wrong to try and shoehorn that in as an interpretation of these verses. That won't wash. That they are not saying. And that it doesn't have to do with. But they are similar in some respects. Conceptually and in in broad theme. So what we can say is the science, the knowledge of what we understand of the past, doesn't undermine or contradict, but it doesn't give us what we need to fully understand what this passage is saying. 
And then we have the second area of difficulty, God regrets making mankind. And there are a number of examples in the Bible where God appears to regret, repent or change his mind. The question is, if God is omniscient, if he knows everything, if he sees the future, if God is everywhere and every when, how is it possible for him to experience regret? Surely he knew what was going to happen. Surely he saw it coming. How is that possible? And we have to be careful not to anthropomorphize here and kind of put things on God that, that we experience. Uh, but it is true that foreseeing something is not the same as experiencing and living through it. And we can find that in our own lives. Things that, you know, maybe we saw coming, but when it happened, it wasn't what we thought it was going to be. That's probably not as it is with God. The truth is we don't know. This is another example of the otherness of God. If God created the universe, he is someone and something that we cannot possibly understand or comprehend. That can sound like a cop-out, but it is an escapable fact. God is other. He is not us. We are not him. Yes, we are made in his image. Yes, something of his likeness resides in us. That there is much about him that we cannot hope to understand. Victor P. Hamilton in the New International Commentary on Genesis said, The fact that the Old Testament affirms that God does repent forces us to make room in our theology for the concepts of both the unchangeability of God and his changeability. One of the things that we learn from scripture is that, that something that can cause God to change his mind or at least to change his direction and change his course of action is prayer. Psalm 55, the psalmist wrote, I call to God and the Lord saves me. Evening and morning and noon I cry out in distress and he hears my voice. That's the experience of one man, one songwriter in prayer as he calls out to God. Abraham prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah and uh, you may remember the conversation that Abraham has with God in Genesis 18. And uh, Abraham said, well, surely you won't destroy the righteous with the unrighteous. What if there's 50 people in the city? And the Lord says, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. In Exodus chapter 32, God threatens to destroy Israel and start over with Moses to build a new nation starting with him. Moses intercedes and God relents. So if you have that idea of God as, as the omnipotent one who has made up his mind, he knows what's going to happen, he's decided his will be done, sometimes you can think, well, what's the point of praying? If God's already decided what's going to happen, what's the point of prayer? Why ask? Well, that's based on an incomplete concept of God and an incomplete idea of how he operates and an unwillingness to accept this tension, this uh, thing that we can't decide, can't understand and, and just can't explain about God that yeah he's omnipotent, yeah he understands and, and knows everything and yet he hears us when we pray. Pascal said God has instituted prayer to bestow on his creatures the dignity of causality. I like that. God has given us a place and a role in his decision making process. Something else that changes God's mind in this story, at least modifies the sentence that he pronounced over mankind. In verse 9 it says this, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with his God. Surrounded by extreme evil, Noah turns his back on it. He, in effect, repents from it. He turns from the behaviour of his neighbours, and compatriots and he turns towards God. Peter in one of his letters calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. He pursued righteousness in his time. He chose in the words of Professor Dumbledore in uh, Harry Potter to do what is right and not what was easy. And on account of his blameless life driven by his faith in God, God provided a way of salvation for Noah and his family. But what was it that God caused 
that caused God to propose this extreme course of action to destroy the human race that he had created. Verse 11 says this, The earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. Someone has said that evil happens when people pursue their own ideas or agendas without regard for the other. Nobody sets out to do evil for its own sake. Yes, there are certain kinds of mental illness that cause people to do evil things because their mind and their thinking is dangerously disturbed. But the kind of James Bond supervillain who expends all his energy and vast sums of money for no other purpose than being nasty to everybody else doesn't really happen. Evil has a motivation and the motivation usually is selfishness. The majority of human evil is rooted in selfishness as unfitted by compassion or concern for the victims, for the others. And the others can be other individuals, it could be people of a different colour, people of a different tribe, people of a different socio-economic group, people of a different nation, but they are other. <clears throat> and the most extreme form is when we use physical or even military strength and violence, not out of self-defence, but to rob, exploit and enslave, enslave weaker individuals and communities. And that is the most extreme form and source of evil. And we have a saying, don't we, that those who live by the sword die by the sword. Violent lives tend to come to a violent end. And there is justice in that. There is justice in that. But the lesson of Noah is that however selfish we may have been, whatever evil we may have participated in, in the past, small or great, if we repent, if we return from it, if we seek God, if we pray, he has provided a means of salvation and his name is Jesus. The Catholic publication, the St Andrew Daily Missal, says it was the wood of the ark which saved the human race and it is that of the cross which in its turn saves the world. The family of Noah was saved by the righteousness of Jesus and the faith of they placed in him. We are saved by our trust in, sorry, by the righteousness of Noah. The family of Noah were saved. We are saved by our trust in Jesus, whose righteousness enabled him to die for our sin because he had no sin of his own. Hallelujah. And so Noah is a type and an image of Jesus, a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament, whose righteousness and faith saved his family. Jesus said to us, I do not call you my servants, but I call you my brothers, by implication sisters. We are his family, saved by our faith and trust in him, whose righteousness enabled him to die for our sin, because he had no sin of his own. So let's pray and thank him. Jesus, thank you that you, uh, like Noah, amongst the evil of your time, you stood for righteousness. You were not tempted and you were not turned, but Lord, you followed, you pursued the will of God for your life. And Lord, you gave up your life and died on the cross. And we thank you. We want to say that we trust you. Lord, help us too in our times to turn aside from the, right, from, from the evil that surrounds us, to turn to you, to seek you and to live our lives in your service. Amen.